When we get into Jeremiah, we step into a world that is not unlike our own. We step in a, into a world that is full of hypocrisy. People would say they were being honest. They would say they were true. They would say they're, they were doing good things. But they were not. They said they were following God. This is a, a religious time. There was no separation of church and state. There was very little pluralism, multiple religions and cultures coexisting. The Israelites were not only a political people, but they were also a religious, a religion and a religious people. So they, as a, as a people, as a nation, would say, we're following God, we're doing what God wants to, us to do, but they weren't. They were not behaving very well, and God, in the way the Hebrew Bible unfolds, decides to do something about it. First, God is going to call a prophet. But the would-be prophet doesn't want to be called. I hope you got that sense of Jeremiah's response in those first few verses. He didn't want to be called. I'm just a kid. I'm only a boy. Leave me alone. God responds, don't say that. You're going to go somewhere, young man. You're going to be something. And you know what? I'm going to be with you. You'll go where I send you, and you're going to say what I tell you to say. And as we hear these verses unfold, then the Lord reaches out and touches Jeremiah's tongue. This exchange, this cultural clash, Jeremiah's voice crying out against the evil of his day reminds me much of our culture and our time. And, and as we look around and we see this broken and evil and struggling world, but it also reminds me, this, this clash, this epic struggle between good and evil, it reminds me of Star Wars. I know that that's probably where most people's mind goes when we open up and start reading Jeremiah. Star Wars or anything else that can grab your attention. But on the desert planet of Tatooine, we meet young Luke Skywalker in the very first movie. And I don't mean first in prequels and things like sequence. I, I mean, the one that came out when I was a kid in 1977, Star Wars. He lives with his aunt and uncle. They're farmers. But Luke seems to want more out of life. He seems to be in a struggle when we first meet him. His uncle buys a couple of new droids to help around the farm. R2-D2 and C-3PO. Even non-Star Wars aficionados probably know R2-D2 and c 3 p And the next thing, R2-D2 runs off, or to be more accurate, wheels off, rolls off. He takes off. And Luke goes to catch up with him. And when he does, he meets Obi-Wan Kenobi, a Jedi Knight. And Obi-Wan introduces Luke to the Force. And he invites Luke to go with him, to go off and fight this evil galactic empire. Star Wars introduces a world in which many people are dishonest, untrue, and do bad things. And in this world, Obi-Wan wants to teach Luke the ways of the Force. And I remember when this movie, when I was a kid, when this movie came out, and how captivated we were by this struggle. We had the action figures, of course, and would play out the battle scenes as kids. And then at recess at school, we would assign parts. Well, we had to have a girl to be Leia, of course. And so that's, uh, we'd include a girl in the game. And then um, I, I had very blonde hair as a child, so typically I was cast as Luke. And then we would run around and have these Star Wars adventures playing out the struggle between good and evil. But back at the beginning of the story, back on the planet of Tatooine, Luke looked over this desert landscape and felt torn. If he followed Obi-Wan, he would be leaving behind everything he knew, everything that was familiar. He would be entering into a, a world that was scary. But if he stayed he knew that he would be settling for something much less than what he felt his potential held. For everyone who knows the story, I've pretty much lost you, I think, at this point. In your mind's eye, you're filling in these battles. You're, you're 
remembering these movies because they were quite captivating. For those who don't necessarily follow the Star Wars saga, Luke goes with Obi-Wan and becomes a Jedi Knight. At the end of the movie, we hear what has become sort of an iconic line in our culture. Obi-Wan reassures Luke. He gives them these famous words. And remember, Luke, the Force will be with you always. Star Wars is a fun movie. It's entertaining. In our culture, the assurance, may the Force be with you has taken on very much a life of its own. In fact, in a survey a couple of years ago in the United Kingdom, I think it was three or five percent of the population claimed Jedi Knight as their religious affiliation. So they actually, they had to have a category then on the subsequent survey. It was a joke, obviously, for people to fill that out. But in the fictional world of a neat plot that comes to a nice, often very tidy, unnaturally tidy ending, right when it's supposed to, Obi-Wan's reassurance is easy to reappropriate, to take up and, and make our own. That's why it's so popular. Remember, the Force will always be with you. It's like saying, just like in Star Wars, good is going to triumph. But when, what about when real world problems enter in? See, in the real world, we don't have Darth Vader. Darth Vader is obviously evil. The breathing, the, the voice, James Earl Jones, voice, sounds evil. We don't have blasters. We don't have the Millennium Falcon or x wing fighters to go off and fight the, the, the Death Star. Instead, we face tests. We say, face real world problems. We face relationships that can be tricky or complicated or difficult. We face uncertainty. We face fear, a future that doesn't wrap up nicely and neatly just the way Star Wars does or so many other movies. So what do we do with real world problems? One thing we can do is we can start out by saying yes to God. We can start out by engaging with our maker. It's not a catch-all, it's not a fix-all that does everything, that does make everything wrap up nicely and neatly. But if we find ourselves resistant to God's call or reluctant to say yes, you're in good company. Because Jeremiah started out by saying no, and, and he got a book of the Bible. There are many other characters in the Bible who struggled or even said no at first. Moses, the list could go on. But life isn't like Star Wars. Even George Lucas, if he was being honest, and I'm not sure that he would, but if he were here and he was being completely honest with us, would have to agree with me that life isn't like the movies. Life has dishonesty and treachery and violence pain and hurt and all kinds of bad things. I'm not talking about the boogeyman. I'm talking about real world problems, real world concerns. And how do we deal with real world problems? We deal with them with a real world God. A God who says to us, I'm not playing around with you. I'm not messing about it. I've got plans for you. Something great and something wonderful. And best of all, I've got more so than these plans, I've got fulfillment. I'm going to give you contentment and joy. I believe in you, and that's why I've called you. You'll be something, and I'm going to be with you every step of the way. I'm never going to leave your side. When you need it, and you call out, and you ask it, I'm going to give you the words. And I'm going to give you what to say when I command you to speak. You might God really say that? Or did God say that to me? Isn't this story, after all, about Jeremiah? Didn't God say that to Jeremiah? Well, yeah, God said it to Jeremiah. But in so many ways and in so many places in Scripture, we see God saying that not just to Jeremiah, but to humanity, to all of us. God doesn't leave us where we were. God doesn't leave us alone. 
And when we say yes to God, when we reach out and we engage with our maker, and when we say, I'm willing to engage with you, God, then I'm changed from the person I was. And I'm changed into the person God wants me to be. And it's the same for every single one of us. If you say, God, take me, I'm willing to engage with you. And you're going to be changed from who you are or were into who God wants you to be. Now, this isn't simply a message for people who have never walked with the Lord before. This is for every single one of us. In fact, most of us who are here right now have been engaging with God. But the reason we call it a faith journey is because we continue it. And we continue to engage. Jeremiah's story didn't end there in chapter 1 when he didn't weasel out of God's call quite so easily. Jeremiah's story continued on through the book. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah continued to engage with God, trust God, follow and listen and do what God was telling him to do for <coughs> 40 years without seeing any lasting results of his work. No wonder he's called the weeping prophet. should be called the manic depressive prophet for that matter. And no, I would be called the cuckoo prophet if, or the cuckoo preacher if, if nothing ever happened. But even though it took so many years, even though he continued to preach, he continued to trust God, God never left his side. And God never leaves our side. We can be sure of that. Sometimes it might feel like God is away. Sometimes when tests get difficult, when life starts to present those real-world problems, and those real-world problems actually stack up and seem like they're ganging up on us, it might seem like God went on vacation. But God hasn't gone anywhere. Now, we live in a broken world. There's no doubt about that. Right? Just you can listen to the news. It's Friday. There's some horrible news. And it would be easy to even doubt God's existence. It isn't often that I have something happen in the week that so perfectly fits with what I wanted to say on Sunday. But this past week, on Twitter, uh, a young man, assume it's a young man, I never met him, it could be anything, but uh, it was a young man who engaged with me and, and uh, sent me a direct message, something to the effect of, come on now, you don't really believe in God. Now this is somebody I'd never met before. And on Twitter, very much, very, I mean, all of my tweets are about God, pretty much. Uh, and it says in my little profile, theologian and pastor. So I thought, well, obviously you want to talk about this. So I said uh, something about thank you for engaging. With, you know, this is a wonderful topic to discuss. And then his response was, can you give me any scientific evidence for God's existence? And I thought to myself, I wasn't the one who started out trying to prove God's existence. I didn't say that to you. And so I said, I can no longer more. And now listen carefully, because I, I had to keep this to 140 characters. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yes, tweeting is a challenge for me. It's almost like a good exercise. I can no more prove God exists. I can no more prove God exists than you can prove God doesn't exist. So the burden's on him. So he came back with a bunch of tweets, and, and I want to read you uh, one of his tweets. So this, this is, your loving God gives people cancer. Your loving God brings people to life in third world countries. If there was a God, why does this happen? To the young man, in, in the event that he sees this message on, on YouTube, I want to say thank you very much. His frustration and anger not only resonates with me, I understand that. But you know what else? It resonates with God. It also sounds a lot like a young prophet who really didn't want to be called. <clears throat> yes, people get cancer. Yes, children are born into countries that have a famine going on and that child doesn't stand a chance in the world and didn't do anything to deserve being born into a country that had no food. 
God didn't cause this to happen. God didn't create the famine or the cancer. But God is with us. God is with that little child. God is with the person who has cancer. Maybe even the cancer survivor. But no matter what happens, God is with us always. Whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we say yes or not, no matter what we are doing or where we are, God is with us. So the next time you have a question, a real world question, not, not a nice, tidy Star Wars type question that could be answered with a blaster or an X-wing fighter, but the next time we encounter something real, remember that we have a real world <coughs> God. And to borrow some of the words of the very wise, fictitious character, Obi-Wan Kenobi, remember, God will be with you.